This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now, I am so excited for today's guest because, you know, two weeks ago I had uh, Joan Leisman on, and now I'm going to be interviewing her better half, John Moody, who played Mailman Mike on the Pee Wee Herman show, and I am so excited, you know, because, you know, I've interviewed everyone else from that special, and you know how much I love it. It's going to be so great. You know, he, of course, uh, was a groundling, and uh, not only did he play Mailman Mike in the Pee Wee Herman show and the um, the Broadway show, but he also wrote episodes of Pee Wee's Playhouse. He um, did the other groundling stuff, like the Paragon of Comedy and Cheeseballs Presents. He was the uh, bus ticket guy, very briefly, in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. He guest starred in The Golden Girls. I did not know Bill Maher had a movie called Pizza Man, and John was in that. I'm going to ask him about that, too, and a couple other things. It's going to be a great conversation, and I can't wait. Today is Cinco de Mayo. Enjoy burritos, tacos, and nachos, and celebrate it with your loved ones. Is the writer's strike over yet? This is just what everyone needs in this scary time. Come on, guys. Come to a decision. There's other things at stake here. I just hope everything will be all right with that. So, yeah, here is my interview with John Moody. Hello? Hey, John. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Um, terrific. How about you? I am uh, just fantastic. I, I can't tell you what a great honor this is. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, uh, come on. <laughs> what can I do for you, Tommy? <laughs> so, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting and performing early on in your childhood? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, I never really wanted to, but I went to this Catholic grade school with these evil nuns, and they used to force me to be in uh, school plays. Oh. <laughs> so it was um, so it was Catholic school that planted that seed, and eventually you came around and liked it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I moved out to L.A. in, I think it was 76. Six or seventy-seven, and I kind of liked the idea of uh, show business, but I, I really had no clue. I mean, I hadn't done any uh, dramatics or anything like that in college or in high school, um, but uh, I knew that's what people did here. Uh, so I guess it was, I was here about three or four years when I discovered the Groundlings and. That's kind of how I started into it. Really, you didn't do any um, any theater or anything when you were in college. No, I was a uh, government and politics major, and uh, that's kind of you know I was kind of half-assed in my way through that. I guess because it was in during the Vietnam War and everybody was into politics, you know. Yeah, um, uh, I was kind of hippie, so. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to do that. I went to University of Maryland just outside of Washington, D.C., so I was, you know, kind of active in that movement in D.C. Uh, at that time. I'm sure you look back now and go, boy, I'm glad I didn't pursue that career. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, and I don't, like I say, I don't know why I thought, oh, maybe I'll go to law school. But then by the time I got out of college, I realized, God, I hate school, so uh, <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to go to more of it. So, um, yeah, I, I eventually moved out here. I moved to Aspen, Colorado for a couple of years and sort of tried to learn how to ski. And I met a lot of people from Los Angeles there, and they kept saying, oh, you should move to Los Angeles. You, could, you should move to Los Angeles. So I did. Um, right. So uh, how did you find the Groundlings? I had worked like a really sleazy job when I first got to Los Angeles in, uh, in a boiler room selling office supplies over the phone. And it, it seemed like most of the people who worked there were actors and writers. 
um, because they could do it in the morning and then they'd be done for the whole day. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, there's this place called The Groundlings and they're just getting ready to open a theater. But a friend of mine is doing uh, some pieces there. They're just doing some some stuff for themselves and invited friends. And I helped her write this piece. Why don't you come along and see it? And I did, and I really liked it. Uh, I, I did really think about, oh, I should do this. But once the theater opened, I went back a couple times to see shows, and I really liked the shows a lot. Mm hmm so I heard they had a school, so I, I said, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give that a try. So I went in and uh, I guess interviewed with the guy who ran the school. and uh, Gary Austin? Said, well, if you got money, uh, yeah, you can be in the school. <laughs> <laughs> so I just signed up for classes there. Yeah, comedy was undergoing changes in the post-Vietnam era. Comedy was getting more irreverent you had the sketch improv groups like uh, fire sign theater the committee the credibility gap second city and then of course in stand-up you know lenny bruce had died and then carlin and Pryor and robert klein had followed their suit were you aware that you were in the middle of this comedy revolution that was happening no i just know that i i like saturday night live and uh mm -hmm. SCTV, and this is sort of what it looked like they were doing so i said yeah Okay, let's give it a try. Yeah. Who, who's there at the Groundlings when you got there? Um, well, let's see. Phil Hartman, Paul Rubens, Edie McClurg, John uh, Paragon. Um, that whole crowd. Uh, I don't know. There's, you probably know more of them than I do. Um, t t uh, Terry Bolo, Gloria Vassi. Terry and... and I had just left, mm -hmm. and I ran into them. Gary Austin left the Groundlings and just started teaching classes. And I had met him a little bit when I was at the Groundlings, and he was still there because uh, uh -huh. they asked me if I would run the lights for the show, um, which I did because it was like I wanted to see the show as much as I could. So, and he was just leaving, so I met him, he called me up when he uh, started teaching classes again, and as well as taking grounding classes, I was taking classes from Gary Austin, mm -hmm. and that's where I met Terry uh, and Gloria. Yeah, Sandy Helberg was there? Sandy Helberg, he had been there and gone, and then he came back. Mm-hmm. So when I first joined the Growlings, he wasn't in the Growlings. But then he came back like, uh, I don't know, maybe a year, two years after I joined the Growlings. Right. And uh, Cynthia Zaghetti? Cynthia Zaghetti, again, she had left the Growlings. The Growlings, I guess, had been really big. It had been like 50 or 60 people or something. And kind of they decided that they wanted to cut the ranks down quite a bit. So they asked some people if, if they wouldn't mind leaving, and of course they did, but they, but they ended up leaving. And then other people just, I guess because Gary had left, just felt like uh, it wasn't their thing anymore. Mm hmm And, um... Yeah, then like by the by the like I don't know early '80s, then like uh, John Lovitz was getting there, and um, George McGrath and Mindy Sterling and Kathy Griffin, all of them. Yeah, they came in uh, like a year, two years, three years after I I joined the Groundlings. Were, were you there with I they? Worked, uh -huh. Were you there? I, I worked with them a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. were, were you there when they did the controversial Easter sketch? No, I wasn't. Oh, oh, oh my God. Every time I, I bring this up, nobody remembers it, but apparently Lynn Stewart's the only one because she, she told me this. Yeah, they did this sketch on Easter where they were making fun of the Last Supper, you know, and the cup of hemlock and all of that stuff, and, it, and people got offended and they walked out. And uh, Doug Cox had written 
that sketch and he was backstage just all distressed like oh my god i wrote this funny sketch and no one liked it what happened and phil phil hartman comes and puts his arm around doug and says you can say all you want about jesus's birthday but don't fuck with the resurrection <laughs> I was just talking to Doug about a half hour ago. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's what that's that's my favorite Phil Hartman story ever. Yeah, it's hilarious. But did you you, you struck up a um, instant rapport with Paul with Paul Rubens and John Paragon? Um, well, first with Paul, I guess uh, I met Pee Wee before I met Paul. Mm -hmm. I was watching a show and he came out and did a Pee Wee bit. And he pulled me out of the office, uh, the audience, to do a, a bit with him. Right. And I was just, I literally just started class and didn't know anything. But uh, I bumped into him a couple of days later at the theater when I was came in for my class. And he goes, hey, wait a minute. Didn't I work with you on Saturday? <laughs> 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 I said, yeah, you, yeah, you did. He goes, well, what are you doing here? I said, I take classes here now. He goes, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll be seeing you. So that, that's kind of how Paul and I bumped into each other. Wow, so he was like totally in character when you first saw him. Yeah, he was He was completely peewee when I first met him, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I, I met him uh, just before the pandemic at a horror convention. I spent over two and a half hours in line waiting, and he was just the sweetest guy, I thought. <laughs> was he there with uh, Cassandra? No, it was it was just him. Um, yeah, normally uh, she normally she's at that same convention, but that year, but that uh, particular one, she wasn't. Yeah, I think I think that convention chooses, you know, the amount of pandemonium that they want, you know, because both because both lines would have been just way out the door, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, Joan was telling me just how much she adored uh, John Paragon, and I remember, you know, Brian Seff telling me that he always thought that John was a better improviser than Paul. I don't know if I necessarily agree, because watching both of them work, they're both pretty quick and on point. Mm -hmm. You know, do you, do you agree? Which, uh, with which one? Do, do you think John, John Paragon was a better improviser than Paul? I think they both, like Paul, what was great about Paul when he improvised was he could do and or say almost nothing, and it would be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas John was brilliant, but he was all over. I mean, he was really physically active and verbally active. I mean, he was, he really was a genius at it. Um, but, yeah, I... Uh, I don't know. I like working with both of them. I, you know, when we when we first started, when I first started in the Groundlings, they they gave me a bit part. They were doing a a the Fat Boys sketch. Oh yeah, where they both you know overdressed in these big pillowed outfits and yeah, I was a, I was the pizza delivery guy. Yeah. I know those those characters are so great, you know they're they're up there in that great tradition of of characters like the wild and crazy guys on Saturday Night Live and stuff. <laughs> so how did Mailman Mike develop over time? Well, what happened was when when I when I started in the Groundlings, one of the first things I did was we had a long improvised uh, soap opera, and it was called Mostly Melrose. Yeah. And so when I came in, uh, they wanted a part for me. So I did the mail, the, not the mailman, but the milkman. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I got a, you know, a white outfit and a white cap and, uh, I, I couldn't get milk bottles. So I just got a six pack of beer and painted everything white. Mm -hmm. came, in with, came in with that. And, Shortly after that, Paul goes, you know, when I see you like that, I think of those old Dick and Jane books. Yeah. You were first book how to read in, in grade school, and you looked like you would be like the mailman, you know, in, in a uniform. And so that's kind of uh, how that started. I, I 
was at the Groundlings one one evening, and I was doing the Late Show, which was at, when we first started. That was like the experimental show where you try out new stuff. And um, so I went upstairs in the attic, and Paul and Phil were sitting up there, and they were talking and smoking a joint. And they said, "Hey, we're doing this show. You want to be in it?" I said, "Sure. Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it." <laughs> a week later said hey we're having a meeting on that show and so Paul said oh I want you to be the milkman and it's going to be just like a milkman from the 50s so um, that's how that started uh, so start as a, as, a, as a milkman then move to the mailman then I mean a mailman I'm sorry yeah <laughs> I get them confused. Uh, no, I was I was the mailman. I'm sorry, right, right from the beginning, because I remember in those days you could go to uh, a uniform store and just buy a, a mailman's uniform. Right. And you can't do that now, but in those days you could. So I think I still have the original mailman Mike uniform in uh, in like a drawer somewhere in, in my house. Yeah. Yeah, the old army surplus stores. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was, you know, somebody had that big leather bag that I first used. Um, they just had it around the house, and they said, uh, oh, here, use this. And so, I don't know. And then Paul decided, oh, I want to bleach your hair blonde. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always wondered about that, like why, why your hair was bleached blonde. Because he wanted, he said he should be real Aryan looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that, and and that was kind of like an ongoing mess. Because the the, the uh, show was only supposed to be a couple weeks, but then it ended up going for months. And we moved it to the Roxy, you know, after it been into Growlings as a midnight show for a while. Right. And then was at the Roxy for I guess the summer, and then. HBO came and, and shot it at the end, end of the summer. So I had to keep getting my hair bleached because uh, my hair was really dark. I mean, it, yeah. I had to get it bleached like every two, three weeks. Yeah. It, I mean, obviously the show had a lot of benign shock value, and the fact that Mailman Mike commits a federal offense at his own job by reading other people's mail is hilarious to my family because uh, we've got postal workers on my dad's side, and we used to watch this and just laugh hysterically, you know, <laughs> at you saying, like, well, I'll tell you, Pee-wee, I don't have time to read all the mail, much less deliver it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He was like he was like the anti Mr. McFeely from Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. <laughs> well, that was kind of the idea. Um, so I was surprised he when he called me back to do it on on Broadway, you know, in uh, 2010, because um, I he he called me and asked me to do it. And I said, well, you know, I thought you would want like a 25, 30 year old male man. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's got to be you. I said, all right, tell me in. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so my history with the special, you know, we taped the special off of our local Fox affiliate in San Francisco back in 1987, just before I turned four. And my parents were shocked at how adult the special was because we had watched Pee Wee's Playhouse and Pee Wee's Big Adventure a lot. And so we had no idea this was going to be adult, you know, but at the end of the day, they, they, they thought it was harmless and... I still have the tape to this day. And well, that, uh, was, that was the original idea of the show, was that it would yeah. be an homage to like the 50s, you know, like Soupy Sales and Captain Kangaroo. And it, it would be an homage to those, but it would be for those same people who are now adults. Right. And that, that's why, and, and even when we did, because I was a writer on Pee Wee's Playhouse, I mean, we'd always work in double entendres and everything. So. Right. I, I never thought in a million years I would talk to you, Joan, Lynn, Nicole, Brian, and Monica, and Donna. It's just so phenomenal because I just, <laughs> I, I love this special. Uh, so when it went from the Roxy uh, to the from the Groundlings to the Roxy, like like did it, was it just a, a totally different vibe? It was 
a different vibe, and we we had to expand the show. I think they added like uh, I don't know twenty minutes or so to it because we we had a, a like a, a certain window at the Groundlings, um, but we're at the Roxy. We had much more time, and we had more production value. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that not that it was great production value, but <laughs> it was it was the set was amazing, and everybody loved the set. And the idea of using puppets, people weren't really using puppets in those days. Now puppets are everywhere. Um, so it, it was, you know, being at the Roxy was, was a lot of fun. And we get people, uh, Joe might have told you this, we get the same people in the audience over and over again. And they'd yeah. be like saying the words with you. So, um, you know, it, it was fun. And we used to sit up, there was a, a really cool box, upper box, like behind the set, uh, where the actors, we, we, would, we would sit up there and watch the audience, watch the show. Yeah. While the show was going on. So that was pretty cool. And there were, and there were a, lot, a lot of celebrities in the audience too, right? Well, the celebrities mostly came when we were at the Groundlings. When we were at the Groundlings, oh my God. Mm-hmm. That's a 99 seat theater, and the Pee Wee show was going at midnight on Saturday, mm-hmm. and there'd be like a thousand people waiting to get in. Um, so, and then you know, the, a lot of VIPs would would come to the show. Um, so that was that was exciting. I remember opening night uh, backstage was just you know full of all the sort of big acts from television at the time, particularly from the sitcoms and stuff. Oh, yeah, because um, Lynn was good friends with um, Cindy Williams, Laverne Shirley. Yeah, they both came, and Robin Williams came, and I don't know, there was, uh, I can't remember the guy's name from WKRP Cincinnati, he was there. Howard Hessman. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if it was that night or another night, but... Uh, Steve Martin was there. I mean, there were a lot of people there. I remember once during during the run, everybody was like, oh my God, Scorsese and De Niro were in the office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're at the Growly, this tiny little theater, and we had a little peephole from behind the uh, from behind the set where we would take turns watching them watch the show. And that was kind of funny. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, my my favorite parts of Mailman Mike in the show are like, you know, op- opening the box of cookies. Do you remember what kind of cookies those were? Um, you know, <clears throat> it was some kind of really bland cookie because every time we tried, like, Paul didn't like that I actually ate the cookies. He thought I should have pretended to eat the cookies. <laughs> 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 no, I'm going to eat the damn cookies. <laughs> so, um... They were either vanilla or lemon, uh-huh. um, because because otherwise my they tried all these chocolates and my teeth would look all chocolatey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was just kind of disgusting looking. <laughs> so. Oh, but that would have worked too <laughs> for the character. And of course, uh, uh, mailman Mike giving John B his hands in the box, and and yeah. he and he says, "I've got something I've been wanting to do for a long time." <laughs> Or the uh, uh, the classic uh, pen pals from around the world. Uh, oh, I love bit. those pen pals from around the world. Yeah, yeah. When we did that on Broadway. That was one of the sort of uh, bits you could count on that one every night. And so people would go, "All right, mm-hmm. you know, you're having a rough night. Oh, pen pals is coming up. That'll that'll get them. That'll get them." So that was always a lot of fun to do that one. Yeah, Shalam, Pee Wee. My name is Shalomo. I'm nine, and I've been in the army two years already. <laughs> or, or, dear Pee Wee, remember me, Lou from prison. <laughs> you know all the stuff. Those are so great. I, I love your reaction when Pee Wee asks you if you know what a Mister Bungle is, and you're like, "Why no?" <laughs> it's so great. Uh, now, I know you wrote episodes of um, Pee-wee's Playhouse, but were you ever in talks about being Mailman Mike on there? Well, the first two, the first two seasons they shot in New York. And so they're only, you know, they didn't want to bring as many people. 
and uh, they wanted to put there was more women in the show. Um, so, and I got a deal to write a movie for New World Pictures. Um, so, like all these things, sort of a confluence, you know, happened, and, and I, I really just couldn't go. Um, what what movie was that for New World Pictures? Uh, I never it never got made. It oh. was called No Smoking, and it was about a serial killer who kills smokers. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! The, around that time, there was a movie about an alien who eats Italian people called Eat and Run. <laughs> so maybe they got they got some ideas from that. Who knows? Saw <laughs> it. Yeah. I don't know. It was just an idea I had, and and. Uh, I was able to get a deal on it with my friend Doug Cox, and we wrote it together. And then uh, New World Pictures went broke. Yeah. And it never got made. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a funny one, though. That would have been really funny. That was that was so yeah. Oh well. But then you. And then when Paul mm-hmm, Paul ahead. came back, he called me up and said, uh, "Oh, do you want to write?" You know some episodes for the playoffs and I said sure so I said can I bring Doug along and he said yeah bring Doug along so you know I think we wrote four episodes uh, over two seasons um, which was really nice uh, and they were really good episodes so I was, I was really happy with it um, we yeah. had one about Miss Yvonne moving in for a week while her house was being painted that's a good one I like that one yeah, Miss Yvonne's visit. And then we had the one where Conky broke down. That's a dark one. <laughs> and Jimmy Smith was the, uh, Jimmy Smith was the uh, Conky repairman. Um, so my favorite thing in that was at, at some point he's trying to fix the robot. And, of course, Miss Yvonne was like, you know, just, you know, mooning all over him, wanting, you know, wanting, wanting to date him. And so she's hanging around and he goes like, Oh, oh, where's my wrench? Is anybody see my wrench? And she yeah. goes, is that a wrench in your pocket? Yeah. <laughs> and he reaches in and pulls out a wrench and goes, why, yes, it is. <laughs> and, he, and he fixed the, the robot with it. So. Yeah, that's that's a great episode. And also the, the Okie Dokie episode. I don't remember that one. Yeah, that was the one uh, where he's got the um, the uh, the Japanese new neighbor Okie Dokie, and I, I can't remember what what else happened in that episode. I, I think in today's but in today's political correctness, I don't think a, a name like that would fly for a Japanese character. <laughs> you know? Oh no, no. Well, uh, we yeah. were originally the guy in uh, Conky's breakdowns. Name was Jesus Espana. Mm-hmm. He wanted to do a, a Latin character in, in the, that show. And then when they got Jimmy Smith, he said, uh, let's just, no, no, I want to change his name and just call him Johnny. Because so, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like, I like saying, okay, Johnny. <laughs> so, so I said, I don't care, whatever you want. <laughs> It's, it's funny, I heard that uh, Sid and Marty Croft uh, was in talks about producing Pee-wee's Playhouse, and the show already has kind of a Croft vibe to it, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, with all the characters, the dinosaurs, uh, you know, that, that, that live in the wall and stuff like that. That's very Croft-esque, like, you know. And I interviewed what, Sid Croft recently. What's weird was, years later, mm-hmm. they had me come in and... I was, we wrote some weird, uh, Doug and I wrote some weird, uh, shoot, a political puppet show mm-hmm. that they were going to do on Fox. Uh-huh. And so we wrote uh, a treatment for it and uh, a bunch of jokes, and they were never able to sell it. But, um, yeah, so we met, I can't remember which Croft we met, the one who was more the producer of the of the two, Marty, or maybe it was Marty. Yeah, uh, we we met him and you know did work with him a while. He's really a fun guy. 
Yeah, Marty was more the uh, the business uh, guy of the of the two. Uh-huh. So it was, it was probably him. I loved the uh, Paragon of Comedy Showtime special. Uh, what, what was it like playing an asshead? <laughs> well, we, I was doing that at the Groundlings. Mm-hmm. John asked, asked me to do that, and so I did it. So I would do all this stuff like, you know, spray, breath spray in my, my mouth and... Um, I think I sneezed once, and you know, just stuff to make it seem more awful. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have the butthead in in, uh, in my office. Mm-hmm. So you kept <laughs> so it. <laughs> I, well, well, no, I, John had it his his house, and I was helping him move, and he said, "Why don't you take that butthead? It should be yours anyway." And I said, "Well, I don't know." I have room for it. No, go ahead, take it. So I said, all right. So I took it. Now it's sitting on a shelf in my office. Um, (laughs) I always have that to remember John by. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Joe told me that was you, and I hadn't even realized it. (laughs) Yeah. Bob Bob Keister. Me me and Edie and Joan, I think, and John were were in that bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, Joan and Edie, they're having girl talk in that sketch, I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that special was so brilliant. Uh, Marilyn Corwin was a dancer. W- wasn't she a groundling? If she was. Like I say, before I came in, it, the groundlings had been around for about four or five years, I think, uh, mm-hmm. before they built their theater. And there had been so many people through there. Gary sort of, like, just had this huge group of people who would take classes and drop in and out and, you know, be in shows when they had something they wanted to show. And right. um, then a lot of them left. We sort of started fine-tuning the groundlings to make the cast smaller and smaller and people who could produce, you know, on a con- consistent basis for the, for the, for the theater. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of the people I, I, I didn't meet. Were you, were you in Cheeseball Presents? I was in Cheeseball Presents, but again, you won't, you won't recognize me. Because <laughs> I'm the guy, uh, have you ever considered a career in microwave repair? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right, that is you. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> yeah. And it just happened one night, I was, there was a guy at the Growlings for a while, his name was John Goodwin, mm-hmm. and he's a makeup artist. Um, and I can't remember how, no, it wasn't him, it was somebody else, I'm sorry, John's a great guy, but it wasn't him. There was somebody at, who came to the groundings was a makeup artist and uh, asked to uh, rent the backstage during the day when we weren't using it so mm-hmm. he could have a makeup class. And I said, sure, but you got to, I was running the business there at the time, and I said, sure, but you've got to make something for me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, okay, what do you want? I said, I want... Uh, uh, a cap, I can put on my head that looks like a human brain. Yeah. And he said, all right. So he made one with the class, and they made one that was really cool. And so I was sitting backstage, I was in backstage at the Growlings one night, and I had this ace bandage in my bag, and I started wrapping it around my face. Yeah. Like, like on the old Invisible Man movie. And I just had the, the skull you know, the visible brain like showing and my you could see my eyes and my mouth. And I started looking in the mirror and after a while I thought, Oh, I've got it and I said to the man, Have you ever considered a career in microwave repair? And it was just really funny and I tried it out on a couple of people and, and they all laughed. So I said, All right, so I'm gonna do that tomorrow in the show. <laughs> so I wrote a, it was a short bit it was like you know probably a minute at the most but every time the lights came up and the people saw me and I said that first line they laughed like crazy 
Yeah. So Phil, <laughs> Phil Harmon was was writing that that show with some other people, a cheese ball, mm-hmm. and he, he said, uh, "Hey, do you want to be in that show doing microwave?" And I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." But okay, well, I'll put you in it doing microwave. So that's how that got in cheese ball. Yeah, um, I've talked to Mike Mike Siegel of uh, him and him and Peter Lacasey. They were a, a comedy team. They were in it as well, and um, another comedy team, Stevens and Gridnick, was in it too. Hmm. There's some great people. Know. There's some great people. <laughs> I don't in think it. I've ever. I, well, I take that back. I did see that we had a big party and they showed it, showed the whole thing at the party. I'm not sure I remember any of it. Joni remembers it really well. I think she actually has a a copy of it somewhere. Yeah, and then Alfred Soul uh, directed it. I, I reached out to him before he passed, but I never heard back. He uh, directed this low-budget horror movie I like called uh, Alice Sweet Alice. What was that about? I, I remember the name. I did a, uh, an unsold pilot for uh, Alfred like a couple years after that. Right. And we shot it all like guerrilla style on Mm-hmm. Melrose, and it was about Melrose. It was before that TV show Melrose came out. He wanted to do a show called Melrose, right? Uh, and so he did, and he was never able to sell it. But uh, he gave me a great part in it. And I really liked it, um, and I always felt bad that he couldn't sell the damn thing. Yeah, it was actually it was actually ironically about um, a Catholic school and. Um, uh, oh. a, a Catholic family, and uh, there's uh, murderings g- going on. That's what it's about. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. They they don't indoctrinate them into going in the show business, though. <laughs> uh, you played the, uh, the the bus station clerk in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and you only have that one line. Sorry, you missed it by five minutes, and then you look up and see how big Randy is. <laughs> yeah. Did you have more to say and it was cut? No, that was it. Uh, you know, Paul just said, oh, yeah, I got your part on, on the movie. It's really small, but it should be fun. So um, I said, all right. So I showed up and they so here's, they just gave me like a page. They said, uh, just, this is your line. And uh, they explained it to me. that was going to be this giant guy that, you give a ticket to that's chasing Pee Wee. So I said, all right. So it was in text. So I, I didn't like Gomer Pyle, sort of. I went, I'm sorry. You missed it by five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you did sound kind of like Jim Neighbors. I, yeah. <laughs> I looked up, yeah. And, and the guy and I. So it was, it was good, I guess, because they did it in one take and they were able to move on. <laughs> yeah. I heard that guy Randy was actually a really nice guy, and um, you know he. Uh, I, I literally just saw him for the. He walked up for the take. Uh huh. We did. We did the take, and then, and then I was wrapped. I just I just <laughs> changed my clothes and went home. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tim Burton. I mean, he, that that was like his first major movie. What do you remember about him? He was just really energetic, and he came over and goes, you know, oh, hi, John, I, I guess he'd seen the show or something. Uh, anyway, so he goes like, okay, you're going to be here, and Randy's going to come up this way, and, you know, you're just going to, he just explained it to me really fast. He goes, let's just do one. And then we did it, and he goes, great, okay, thanks. <laughs> 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 I guess you have to, when you can get it quick, they, you know, that's to just move on. <laughs> yeah, Diane Salinger, who played Simone, um, I I interviewed her for the first time five years ago, and uh, my mom and I we went out to L.A. and we had lunch with her, and uh, now her and my mom are really good friends. Sometimes I'll, oh. I'll I'll be going into the kitchen and they'll be on the phone having really dirty girl talk, and I'm like, oh my god, Simone from Pee Wee's Big Adventure is having dirty talk with my mom. I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Was uh was Pee Wee's uh, big holiday fun to do? It was fun to do. Um, I think I was saying we were in this little in that little restaurant for like a week. Uh, you know, shooting all this background stuff, and 
So I had to drive up there every day, and uh, Paul was there, so I got to talk with him a bit. And then another guy who had been uh, in the Pee Wee show in, uh, when it was on Broadway, was mm -hmm. in the end. he was one of the singing group. And uh, but another old growling guy, John Mayer, was there. He played the, uh, I, I think he was the, the guy, the, the drugstore guy, uh, the apothecary who, I, I can't remember what his character was, I don't know. He was like a doctor, but he, he wasn't. He ran the drugstore. It's like the, the locals would eat in that diner. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I saw the movie when it when it first hit Netflix, and I was like, "Wow, this there's there's this is pretty cool. There's some really good stuff in here." You know, I was shocked. I never thought that there would ever be another Pee Wee movie again. I'm surprised there hasn't been others since. Well, that's kind of why we did the show again on Broadway because he wanted to do a movie. Mm -hmm. We started in in L.A. and we had played in L.A. for I don't know how many weeks, like eight ten weeks. And then they got a deal to take it to New York. Uh, and then we we did it in L.A., uh, I want to say in like January, February, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we, we ended up going to New York to start rehearsals in New York on, in October. And then it played there through through January, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and then they taped the last night they, they taped it for HBO again right so they um that must have so felt yeah that was a lot of fun I, I still mm -hmm. have such a soft spot for the first one because it, it was so homemade and had a real family yeah you know and everybody you know for the most part was from the groundlings and we had worked with them on stage, and we all got together, and we just came up with it. I don't know. It was just really fun to do. And then making, uh, you know, the puppets out of rubber chickens and stuff. I mean, it was just really terrific. Yeah, but it must have yeah. felt great, though, to be on Broadway. You probably never thought you'd get that far. Yeah, we always were, were talking about it. It was such a sensation here in Los Angeles when we did the first one back in 81 that there was all this talk that we were going to go off Broadway, and, and but it never happened. Um, but damn, it just, it, it finally did happen, like 30 <laughs> years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it happened, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Let so, Lynn told me last night that uh, you you were you had her back when when you two were um, doing the show on Broadway. She said you know she was she was, I think she was kind of scared of the vibe of New York, you know. And you you made it all you you made everything okay. <laughs> well, she she I remember her calling me up. We we ended up on the same flight going to New York. Uh huh. And uh, it was kind of a fiasco. <laughs> Because we we get to JFK and we're waiting for our luggage and I got my luggage and so we're waiting for her luggage. She goes, "Oh, that's it. Get that." And so I reached and grabbed it and gave it to her and we hustled it. We got a taxi and hustled into town. <laughs> <laughs> Later, the luggage she had gotten the wrong piece of luggage. Yeah. <laughs> Taking somebody else's piece of luggage, and I guess the the, the bags look you know pretty much identical, and uh, so this guy ended up with hers. He opened it up, and I guess he was able to figure out who it was. And she called the airline, and the airline somehow straightened out. But she had to take a taxi all the way back out to JFK and switch bags with this guy, and then come all the way all the way back in. Um, <laughs> that was kind of hilarious. And the next morning she calls me and goes, well, I, I don't know how to find the rehearsal hall. Yeah. And I said, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll, I'll come over to where you're staying because we were really far apart where we were staying. I was up on 80th Street and she was down, I don't know where. She was like 
I, I have no idea what the name of the place was, where she was. Um, but it was far away. It was on the other side of the theater for me. So I ended up down there. I think I took a, a, a like the subway and then a bus to get there. And I said, Lynn, you could actually walk there from here, but if you wanted to take the bus, you could take the bus. I showed her how to take the bus, where to take the bus. And so I took her to the rehearsal hall. I said, this is the rehearsal hall. You need to be tomorrow. She said, we'll give yourself plenty of time. And I said, now while we're here, I'm going to show you how close we are to the theater. <laughs> so I walked her over to the theater, and I said, this is where the theater is going to be. And uh, we went inside, they, and the, the people in the box office were really nice. We told them who we were, and we were going to be there. And so oh, you want to come in and look around? So we, we, they took us, let us go in and look around. And so she felt a lot more comfortable. Um, so, yeah, she would call me up every night if she... If she had a problem, you know, oh, I, I blew a line or I missed something or this yeah. person missed the cue and it threw me off and something like that. I just, I just say, Lynn, they love you. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, she's, yeah. A, great, she's a great lady. Yeah. You guest starred on The Golden Girls. How did that come about? Um, actually, there were some... There was an ex-groundling who was working on The Golden Girls as a writer-producer named Barry Fanero. Mm-hmm. And he called over... <clears throat> he knew Doug Cox and myself really well because we had all worked together. I had done an uh, improvised piece with uh, Barry Fanero <coughs> on stage where we started out calling it three hats, we would, we would, the two of us would go out and then we'd uh, pull somebody from the audience and there were three hats. We'd have them pick a hat and we'd pick a hat, you know, and we'd all have a hat. And then we'd ask the audience, you know, who are these characters based on, you know, how they look with the hat and everything. And then we'd improvise a scene. Well, after a while, we thought, uh, well, what's funnier than had wigs? So we got really outrageous wigs. So we started doing it with wigs. And it worked really well. So, you know, they... I knew Barry from the Growlings. He didn't stay too long. And he had done a piece with Doug mm-hmm. where they... In, in the early days I was at the Growlings, we never had enough material to fill out a show. Right. So there'd always be a part where we had to vamp, and it would either be, you know, uh, a two-minute vamp or a ten-minute vamp, <laughs> and you had to figure out how to do it. So I was going home early one night, and, the, and Doug and Barry Fanero were were going to vamp, and they said, they, they came up to me like, well, we have to kill some time. What are we going to do? And I said, i tell you what you do. It was during the, the football, there was a football strike, an NFL strike. And so they were showing Canadian football on where they would usually show NFL football on television on Sundays. Mm-hmm. I said, why don't you go out and explain the rules of Canadian football to the audience? And they thought about it and went, oh my God, what a great idea. So <laughs> they got all these weird... We had we had so much crap in those days behind stage at the Growlings. They brought out like had a hockey stick and a weird helmet, and, yeah, <laughs> uh, sweaters and stuff. And they just started making up stuff, you know, because nobody knew the rules to Canadian football, so they could say whatever they wanted. So they just started making up stuff, and it became very funny. So Barry always liked that we had done this stuff with him. Uh, so he he called us and said, "You guys, you come in." And read for this, find another guy. So there was a friend of ours, Jim Dugan, who was in the ground leagues at that point. And we got him, and we said, oh, let's go down and, you know, audition for this with some of the other, you know, and we'll see, because they, because Barry really wants us to be in it. So that's what we did. And it was, yeah, they picked us, and we did it, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And they were great. It was great working with the Golden Girls. They were really just wonderful. Every one of them was really wonderful. Yeah. It was my 
my mom's favorite show. So <laughs> you know, for her to see me on the Golden Girls was just she was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Bridget Sienna did a voice for it too. She's a she's a great lady too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, what else do you want to know? You did a movie with uh, Bill Maher called Pizza Man. I didn't even know this movie existed, and I I went um, on YouTube. There was there was like little scenes from it, but not the full movie. Uh, what was it like working on that? That was a. Yeah, that was a really ultra low budget movie. Um, they made for like a couple hundred thousand dollars or something, and shot it on sixteen millimeter. And we shot most of it in a warehouse. This guy, this guy had written the first draft of the guy who directed. Had written the first draft. Poor Pretty Woman, and then it was bought, and it was rewritten a bunch of times, um, and became a big hit. But because of that, I can't even remember the guy's name now, and I apologize for that, but, well, old age is setting in, is what I'm going to go by. Um, He was directing it, and he had a bunch of growlings in to audition for parts, and I got the part of Bob Woodward. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) And so I worked with Bill, you know, for a couple of days. He was a great guy to work with. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Um, and we shot in the warehouse for a whole day. Then another night we went down to Sunset Boulevard to, what is that place? Shit, on Sunset, something of the world where they had that weird little building with the world on top of it. Oh, um... And the World Trade Center? No, in, in, in Hollywood. Oh, the the Capitol building? No, 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 no. Oh. This is right on Sunset Boulevard. Um, shit. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, I we know went you lived there. there. <laughs> and, and you we, lived there. <laughs> and we stole yeah. a shot yeah. of Bill Maher and I, like, walking into an alley, and then the alley was actually in the warehouse. We just wanted a background shot to establish, you know, establish that we were in Hollywood. So, um, that movie, I think I saw it once. I couldn't make the premiere because I had to do something else that day. It was, it was, so I had to go back. I think it was only running for like a week. Uh, so I had to go back and see it in the theater. Um, when there was like four people in the theater, it was me and Joni and like two other people. <laughs> it was not a, a big a big film, but it was it was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. I don't know if Joni told you, but she worked with Bill Maher at one point too. Hard Knocks was the show. Was that what it was? Yeah. That was like well, the last three camera sitcom that Showtime ever produced, or one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, J.F. Lawton was the writer and director of Pizza Man. Ah, okay. Yeah, because you were trying to come up with, with, with the guy's name. Um, he went on, I think he wrote um, that Steven Seagal movie where they were on a ship and they took over a, ba- a battle. Under Siege. Yeah. 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 I didn't realize that um, Paragon directed a Barbarian Twins movie, Twin Sitters. I was, is that the one I was in? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hard time remembering my, you know. You were an an FBI agent. I was an FBI agent, and it was just a a one day, again, just a one day part, but it was really fun working with John. Um, And they had to bring a stuntman in, because... there was a, uh, they had a breakaway window that broke, that there was a gunshot in it, and it broke the whole, like, uh, sliding door window, and then the stuntman had to dive across the table and save this guy's life. Uh, so, and they had one take, because they could only afford one window. Um, 
And also uh, Victor Vino, who played Ricardo on Pee Wee's Playhouse, was in it. I've interviewed what? him. Very nice guy. Um, Suzanne Kent, who played Mrs. Renee, she was a groundling. I'd love to interview her, but she hasn't been on Facebook in years. <laughs> her, her and Terry were roommates a long time ago. Um, east of Hope Street, um, I, I don't know what that is, and it doesn't have your character name. Do you, do you remember that? I don't think that's me. Okay, that's an IMDb flubber, then. We'll skip that. IMDb is, I, I just got to say, they are terrible. They get things <laughs> wrong all the time. I find out every day how terrible they are, John. I find out every day. I'm always bringing up stuff that, you know, the person never did, and I just, I feel so embarrassed that I'm even bringing it up, bringing it up you know? <laughs> no, it's not your fault. I know, I know, <laughs> because they're just... They're just terrible at that. Uh, some people I've talked to, though, they've been um, they've been lucky enough to get all, to get all that crap uh, taken off of their entry, you know, uh, which is very rare. But, it's so um, hard to deal with those people. You try and correct something or add, it's just it's just impossible. So I I, I stopped. I mean, I had all these titles from things I'd written, and I wanted to put them on there, and it was just. It was just, it was just too much work. Um, no. <laughs> you were on the Jay Leno show. No. <laughs> that was not, that was, that was, that's not one either, okay? No. <laughs> so the stuff that IMDb has not mentioned that you've written, like what, what's, what's a good example of some of those, if you can remember? <laughs> well, the Pee Wee shows. Right, well, they're on here. That I did. Um, and then, uh, Doug Cox and I wrote a lot of stuff for Elvira, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think we're mentioned for any of that on IMDb. Doug might be. I'm, I'm, he's better at like getting that stuff sorted out than I am. And then I also wrote a, a really interesting, a kind of an interesting project, um, a Malaysian children's uh, cartoon show. Huh. And uh, we had, I'd had a meeting uh, with Doug Cox. So I'd had a meeting at um, uh, Nickelodeon to sort of come in on some cartoon show that was really big at the time. But uh, the creator of the show, I mean, I think he felt we were too aggressive or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he didn't want, want us on. But they always remembered us. And, and one of the women we had met with started producing this show. It was an international show that was set in a Malaysian village. It was called Kampong Boy. <laughs> and so she called us up and asked us if we would do some. We said, sure. So we did four episodes of that as well as the uh, pilot. They, they had a problem with the pilot, and they said, "Will you guys rewrite the pilot for us?" And we said, "Sure," but we get, you know, we get the credit on it. She said, "Oh, that's no problem." So we did that, and then we left because I don't know uh, some of the people there weren't great to work for. <laughs> <laughs> so we just said, uh, "Yeah, either you pay us more money, or we're just just leaving." But a year after I did that show, I was in um, Australia working on a Jackie Chan movie, mm -hmm. doing rewrites on the set. Uh -huh. And the guy who invented the, who invented the Camp on Boys, a guy named Lot, uh -huh. uh, L A T T, and he's like was like the hero of uh, Malaysia. He had to move out because he, other than doing the kid stuff, he also wrote political cartoons, and they were going to throw him in jail. So he moved, I think he moved to Singapore so he could get away from them. But anyway, I was in, in Australia, and we ended up having this party at this, um, this karaoke bar and restaurant that was called Lot. L-A-T-T, apostrophe S. Mm -hmm. And I said to the guy, uh, 
What was that guy? I said, mm-hmm. you know, there's a really famous uh, cartoonist mm-hmm. in Malaysia named Lottie. goes, yeah, we named this after him. <laughs> <laughs> We're, the, the owners are Malaysian, and, and they worship the guy. They think he's, he's like a hero. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize that this guy had such reach that, you know, mm-hmm. he was known all over the world, kind of. So, anyway. Did, did you work on um, on the television? Yes, on the television, uh, wrote an episode, and then I was in two other episodes mm-hmm. as Pee Wee Herman, although they called him Gigantic Herman. Oh, <laughs> In fact, I think <clears throat> I think you can see that on YouTube. It's pretty funny. Oh, I gotta go look for that. What, what did Paul think yeah. about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's never mentioned it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it, I know he saw it. <laughs> oh man, that 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 must have been hilarious. Like like writing that sketch. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't the one we read, wrote. That was a. a Somebody else wrote that one, but the, because I'd known Paul for a while, and I also used to run his office, used to run his, uh, he had a big fan club. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I used to run his fan club um, in Los Angeles. So that's why they asked me, because they figured, oh, he would know, know how to do Paul. So I did like a, I, I thought a pretty funny Paul. They really liked it. And then later on, they did an award show, and they had me come on to give an award as Gigantic Herman. <laughs> Sounds like, though, that Paul uh, put a lot of trust in you. <laughs> you know, overall, because, you know, if you're running his fan club and he's bringing you back to do things, I mean, that obviously means he, he had a lot of trust in you. Well, I guess. Uh, he's doing it, they... They're doing a, well, I don't know if it'll ever get finished. They're doing a documentary on him in, uh, on HBO. Uh-huh. It, my guess is it won't be out for at least another year. But um, he asked me to do a long interview with the HBO people um, about Paul and about Pee Wee. So remember, we shot that right here in my apartment. Uh, about a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> it's probably going to be a Judd Apatow production because he's doing all the comedian documentaries. Oh, is he really? Oh, yeah. He did uh, Gary Shandling and George Carlin. and. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, of course, you know, he produced uh, Pee-wee's Big Holiday. Yeah. I remember meeting him. We had a screening of the HBO show. Uh, I can't remember where it was. It was at one of the big agencies. Uh, you know, at a big theater. We did it there, and, and Judd Apatow was there. And so, you know, he was talking with all of us about, because they, they had just started writing the movie. So he was talking about us being on Broadway and what it was like to do the show and all that kind of crap. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you got going on these days? Right now, I'm working on a novel, and I'm not sure how long it's going to take me because I've never written a novel before. Uh-huh. Uh, I think I'm on my third draft now. There'll probably be two more drafts. But, you know, I, for the last, when I was in the growling, something really weird happened. And then I, I came up with this piece, and it was called credit card central mm-hmm. and the joke of it was I was watching this was, you gotta remember this was back in the early 80s I was watching the news one night and they talked about you know the credit card companies have all this information on you and they're starting to share it with people which you know now with Facebook and everything right. it's second nature to us but back then it was really shocking so I wrote this piece that was kind of a, a I, I kind of mixed it with writing and with improv where I worked in a place called Credit Card Central and Joni and Doug Cox ran with me and Joni had fallen in love with this guy 
just by processing all his credit card stuff. <laughs> seemed really fascinating and interesting, and you know, she had in her mind she had you know built him into something. And but I had a crush on her, and I was always trying to date her, and she wouldn't date me. Um, and then we do a whole story about this guy that you know she was she was enamored with, and the way we would do it was. Before the piece, I would come out. I used to do a lot of MC work at the Groundlings. I would come out and go like, "Well, uh, there's a little. We need to cover a little time while the while the uh, cast changes their costumes." So I just thought I thought I'd come out and talk to you a little bit. And I said, "How many of you have ever bought anything, purchased anything using a credit card?" And people would raise their hands. So I took a guy out of the audience. I go, go down and I interview him, and I get his name where he lived, his occupation, what kind of car he drove, his favorite restaurant, uh, is he married or single, does he have any pets, uh, you know, I, a whole bunch of stuff. Like, I think there were eight or ten different things I got. And then we come up and do this piece, and the whole piece was about that guy. All the information in the piece was the information I'd gotten from the audience. So the people just really loved it. And it turned into this big thing where he was, you know, there was a, an emergency with, with this guy's, you know, credit card, you know, bill and all this stuff. We had to solve it and I was going to get fired. And, and so we did this whole piece about it. And at the, at the end, you know, I, I became the big hero. I saved the day. And I would... At, the last thing was, was like, I would use, uh, like his favorite restaurant. And, and I would, I go to Joan and said, you know, you know, I was like, you know, go out with me or marry me or something. He goes, I'll, I'll take you to, you know, whatever Pedro's Mexican restaurant. You'll have, you'll have so much Mexican food. You'll shit guacamole. <laughs> I mean, this piece went <clears> on and <throat> on. It kept building, and Ray Colcord, who was the musical director at the time, did this great build with, like, I think it was, a, it was one of the, maybe the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. Oh, yeah. He, went about, da, 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 da. he just kept building it until it was bigger and bigger. And Doug was, was my boss, and he was... He was happy he hired me, then he was going to fire me after that, and he stuck his neck out for me and all this stuff. And then, you know, in the end, when I solved everything, it's like, uh, you know, you, you know, you, you, know, you, you, you save the, you saved the day. I knew you could do it all the time. The board was against it, but I, I stuck by you. Uh, and then at the end, I go like, you know, I told Joan I was going to buy her a car, which was the car the guy had, and take her to the restaurant. She goes, how can you afford all this? And I goes, well, while I was out in the audience, I ripped off so-and-so's credit card, and we're putting it on his account. And then we'd all laugh, and the audience went crazy over it. Yeah. <laughs> it was like one of the most popular pieces we, we ever had. But because of that, people started wanting us to do uh, corporate gigs. Mm-hmm. Because they'd want to see the boss like I would do the boss as the guy. And they love to see that. So they started flying us all around the country to do these corporate gigs <laughs> that were, we'd, we'd write all this <laughs> special stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. But then, yeah. you know, we would work this in into the show, too. This was like the, the cap piece of the show. And my God. They took us, I mean, they flew us down to Cancun, they, they'd take us to, you know, Tempe, they'd take us to Miami, to Orlando, to Tampa, um, San Francisco. I mean, we just started flying all over the place doing all these uh, corporate shows. And then after I left the Growlings, people just started calling me up to do corporate shows for them. So. Uh, nice. It's pretty good money, huh? It was really good money. Doug and I would do those, and then they started asking us to write and direct videos. It was all comedy stuff. It was literally just like what we did at the Ground Lakes, mm -hmm. but for like 
a billion times more, you know, more money. Um, so we started doing videos and live shows for all these big corporations, and we ended up doing a lot of work in Silicon Valley. You know, it was That's sad. where I'm from. <laughs> Are you really? Yep, San yeah, Francisco. So yep. We did that for, jeez, probably 20 years. You know, because you could still do, you could still do, you know, any showbiz work that came along at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's uh, what I've been doing. Um, but now I, that sort of pandemic kind of killed that, and um, I don't know, I haven't really wanted to go back to it. So I said, well, I think I'll write a novel. So that's, that's where I'm at now. Well, I hope you finish it. It sounds like it's going to be good if you're writing all these um, drafts. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, it's got to be good if you keep re rewriting it, you know. I mean, once you get to the final draft, it's going to be a masterpiece. I hope. I hope. How, how, how long have uh, you and Joan been together? Um, since 1980. Wow, a long time. Yeah, she's she's a gem of a lady. You're a lucky man there, I have to say. John, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing these sure. great stories. And again, I hope you finish that novel and get it out there because life is too short. You gotta, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta get things done. You know. <laughs> I'm working on it. Awesome. Awesome. You have a great day. Happy Cinco de Mayo and be safe out there. Oh, well, that's right. Thank you. Take care. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. John Moody. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. And great stories there. And jo yeah, jo Joan's a great lady. Thank you so much, Joan, for connecting John and I. I enjoyed this conversation. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes.